Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series for a Synodal Church, Communion, Participation, and Mission. At this time, I invite uh, Bishop Crosby, uh, Bishop Douglas Crosby, OMI, uh, Bishop of Hamilton and Chairman of the Episcopal Commission for Evangelization and Catechesis to lead us in prayer. Welcome, Bishop. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, a pleasure to be here and, uh, and congratulations to you and, and the team at the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops for uh, organizing this, uh, this conference. And, uh, and I, I look forward to, to all, of the, all of the sessions, actually. I think it's going to be a very interesting and informative uh, program. So, and uh, welcome to all of you from across the country. Uh, there's a really good response. There's been a very good response to, to the uh, program. And, uh, and so it just indicates that there's high interest in what's going on. And a real, a real uh, awareness that uh, we have uh, star speakers at, at, at each uh, at each program. So, uh, uh, congratulations to the organizers. I'm going to start off by just saying the Atsumas prayer, uh, and uh, which has been uh, which has been uh, modified a little bit to reflect the synodal experience. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity, so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you, who are at work in every place and time, in the communion of the Father and the Son, forever and ever. Amen. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Bishop Crosby. I uh, really appreciate your uh, support, your presence. You've been uh, very, very, very present to all of our sessions that we've had in the last year, and we, we're really grateful for that. So thank you. So Pope Francis is quoted as saying, synodality is the way of being the church today, according to the will of God, in a dynamic of discerning and listening together to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So the Synod on Synodality opening in Rome, uh, opened in Rome on October 9th and 10th, 2021. Every diocese around the world has been and continues to be engaged in that dynamic of discerning and listening together to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Many of you have been participating in this process within your local parish community. You are at the point, I believe, of gathering your responses for submission and we know that the synodal journey will not stop with the report, but we hope this series will help you um, to deepen the reflection on what the church is being called to at this time, and that it will help, uh, help us to continue to walk the synodal path uh, into the future. So today, our, uh, pre our presentation will focus on that first element of communion. Uh, for Synodal Church Communion. And we have um, two wonderful speakers joining us, Dr. Moira McQueen and Mr. David Daler. Dr. McQueen graduated in law from the University of Glasgow, Scotland, and worked as a lawyer for several years, specializing in family law and juvenile court. After her Master of Divinity degree from the Faculty of Theology, University of St. Michael's College and the Toronto School of Theology, Moira graduated with a PhD in Moral Theology, also from St. Michael. She has been teaching Moral Theology at St. Michael's Graduate Faculty of Theology and in the University of Toronto since 1994. And she's written and co-authored many articles and books book chapters in bioethics, fundamental ethics, and other areas. 
Her book, Bioethics Matters, was translated into several languages. And in February 2022, her book, Walking Together, a primer on the new synodality was published. Dr. McQueen was appointed executive director of the Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute in July of 2004. The Institute, ha the Institute has a mandate to conduct research and education in bioethics from a Cat Roman Catholic point of view, pursuing bioethical issues in palliative and end of life care, reproductive technologies, stem cell experimentation, genetics, transgender issues, and other current areas. As executive director, she's deeply involved in community education through the CCC, CCBI's courses in bioethics for parishes and through lecturing and cons consultancy sessions with school boards, healthcare institutions, priest seminars, conferences, and through media appearances. She is frequently consulted uh, by the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. Most recently, Moira was a, a contributing writer to the uh, Horizons of Hope Palliative Care Toolkit that uh, was, was launched last November. In September 2014, Pope Francis appointed Moira for a five-year term to the International Theological Commission, a 30-member Vatican advisory board within the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith. She was uh, the Canadian lay representative at the Second Synod on Marriage and the, fam and the Family at the Vatican in October 2015. Dr. McQueen and her husband, Dr. Matthew McQueen, have seven children and to date, 12 grandchildren. Last but not least, she is the founding president of the Sarah Club of Halton, the past president of the Sarah Canada Council and a vice president of Sarah International. Welcome, Moira. David Daler has worked as an educator, parish minister, adjunct faculty at St. Michael's University, retreat facilitator, facilitator, faith formation consultant, and program coordinator in the Diocese of Hamilton. David holds a Master's of Theological Studies from St. Michael's University, University of Toronto. Recently retired as Director of Discipleship and Parish Life Office for the Diocese of Hamilton, he has assumed the role of Director of Catechesis and Discipleship at St. Anne's Parish in Ancaster, Ontario. David is a co-author of uh, Gifted by God, a Confirmation Preparation Program and DVD Retreat Resource published by Novalis. His first book, Being a Man After God's Own Heart, Addressing Issues of Man's Spirituality is a popular parish resource. His latest, sharing, his latest, Sharing Our Stories, Sharing Our Faith, is a resource for grandparents, and it came out in 2017. Much, much of David's current ministry work involves the importance of grandparents and seniors in passing on the faith. Please welcome Dr. Moira McQueen and Mr. David Daler. As we, we set off today, Moira and I decided we would do this in a dialogical form uh, rather than, than just give you two talks. So we're going to engage in a conversation together that, that models this new word, synodality. Now, it may be new to us and to people in the pews, but it's not a new word or a new concept. This is one of Pope Francis's favorite words. Brenda, the first slide, please. So it's a Greek word. And it means on the way with. There, there's a lot to unpack in this. If we look at it together, walking together, journeying together, there's a lot to unpack within those words. And Pope Francis wants us to unpack all of it. One, one of my favorite biblical passages on synodality is that of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, where Cleopas and his companion are joined by the resurrected Christ. He walks with them and explains the scriptures to them. The biblical passage ends with a meal in which they are finally recognizing him in the breaking of the bread. Synodality is about walking together in a shared search for Christ in scripture, prayer, and common life. So in order to do this, we have to understand both the context and the meaning of the word synodality. In a moment, Moira is going to guide us through a theological and historical context 
for the understanding of what synodality means. Pope Francis uses three words to describe synodality, communion, participation, and mission. All three will be unpacked over the course of the three sessions together. Today, we will focus on communion. First of all, as Christians, we're called to manifest communion, unity. Why? Well, because it's the nature of God. God is a communion of three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're baptized in the name of that Trinity, and thus should show to the world that same unity and communion. This is the only way that we can discern God's will and how we're to go on the mission. It's never about our idea or my idea, but rather God's idea as discerned by the community. The Pope tells us that the point of a synodal church is to listen as the entire people of God to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. It's to make us, the people of God, actors in the process of discernment rather than passive onlookers. So the Pope, through the Synod documents, asks us to speak boldly and honestly and to create a space for those who seldom get to speak to do the same, especially the voices of the young, women, and the marginalized. He's calling the church to connect the three voices, the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of the people of God, and the voice of the apostles in the role of the bishops into one as not a, in a one-off process, but on a journey towards a permanent conversion. So it's important to remember that for this process to be effective, all three voices, the bishops, the people of God, and the Holy Spirit must be engaged. To better understand what synodality means, let's turn to the preparatory document and see what we hear there. Brandon? The purpose of the synod and therefore the consultation is not to produce documents, but to plant dreams, draw forth prophecies and visions, allow hope to flourish, inspire trust, bind up wounds, create a bright resourcefulness that will enlighten minds, warm hearts, and give strength to our hands. And so we turn to church history and documents to see how this is not a new idea, but rather a rediscovery of a process which has been in place since the early days of the church. Mar, over to you. Thank you, David. And of course, this is so important, uh, the whole point of this synodality not being new in our whole Catholic tradition, although it certainly sounds new to many people and perhaps the method of its presentation is currently very different from the beginning. But from the beginning, and using that phrase deliberately, at least from the beginning of the way or the beginning of Christianity, and obviously not from the very beginning, then it was very clear that disputes would arise as they do today, and that people had many matters needing clarification because this was a new way and people then, as people now, have very different interpretations of how to handle matters. So although they didn't call it the Council of Jerusalem at the time, there was a, a major problem, there were several problems, but a major problem about circumcision. And that arose because the Gentiles, the new followers of the way, thought that circumcision wasn't necessary. And of course, anybody in the Jewish tradition, this was something extremely important for them. So there were problems. So they gathered people together. Paul tells us in Acts how they gathered together. And the wording was really important that the, the apostles and the elders gathered together. So not just the apostles, right from the very beginning, there were other people, the lay representatives, you might say, present there. And the way Acts phrase it is, they all gathered to listen. And as David said, and as the Pope emphasizes time after time, the very crux of synodality is about listening, listening to one another and discerning from that listening, but listening first. So 
not going into the actual dispute at the time, but also just to point out that, in fact, James was the person who spoke. We would assume that Peter would speak or perhaps Paul, but it already showed us that there are different forms of leadership, different forms of reaching out. But James actually announced the decision that was made after the listening process. And I think what's important for today is that that Council of Jerusalem shows us how the context is important, how leadership is important, but mainly the priority of the spirit. And of course, synods did develop, and there were several of them in the early church. And again, we can understand why they would do that. The church spread very, very rapidly throughout Europe and Asia, Asia Minor in particular in the earliest days. So people needed to talk. Uh, the bishops, the early foreign of the church, they needed to come together to talk about matters, to sometimes resolve disputes, but also to raise new points and new questions. So the tradition of coming together was, it was and is, again, very important. And it's true that after the Reformation, the Catholic Church moved away from using the synodal process. But the Eastern Catholic Church, the Eastern Church, and the Anglican Church all continued to do so. So, for example, if you speak to someone from the Anglican denomination, the word synod is not the least bit surprising to them, as it sometimes is to some of us Catholics. So it's in the tradition in the Christian form from, as I said, the beginning of the way. It really came back into motion because of the Second Vatican Council. And I think what's interesting, at least it's always interesting to me just to see why things happen, not just that they happened, but we do live in a traditional church and there are always reasons for things. And the reasons then can be helpful for us, the reasons now. And the bishops coming together and all of them for a council, all the bishops come for a council and that's why there are so few. There was the, the Vatican I in the 19th century, Vatican II in the 20th century. So 100 years almost even between the two councils. Very expensive. Everything, people being away from their dioceses, everything that's involved in having a council of the whole church. But matters had changed quite considerably in as much as many of the far-flung bishops felt that their voices weren't being heard in Rome to the same extent as other people's voices. And we know how this can happen in any organization. And the bishops really wanted to be able to speak together about doctrinal and pastoral matters on a much more regular basis. And so again, they were listened to, they made a very strong case for it. All this is documented in the archives of, of the Vatican II Council. And afterwards, Pope Paul VI, said that they would reinstitute the Synod of Bishops and that Synod would meet on a fairly regular basis so that the voices of the bishops who were not always being heard in Rome, at least that's what they were saying, could in fact be heard. And I think there's a real lesson there for us today in terms of the bishops themselves recognized that they needed more of a voice and there are other sectors in our church today that really feel the same way. So can I have the next slide, please? So just to show, I call it a theological pendulum, just to show that things do change in the Catholic Church and sometimes people do not believe that that's the case and they sometimes don't see the reason for further changes, which in some ways our new method of doing synod is, is actually bringing to the surface. But again, looking at it, from a, maybe a fairly recent tradition, but still from a very important tradition, anything that comes from a council is the highest teaching level of the church and therefore has more impact than any other of our teachings. So the Second Vatican Council itself was looking for a giornamento. They were realizing that because of new questions, new times, the new era, then many, many matters had to be discussed and that this was a way of doing it. This was, as Pope John XXIII said, opening a window onto the world, maybe into the world. He didn't see our church as being something separate, but something very much as being involved globally 
involved with people globally and certainly having a voice globally and a very strong voice at that. So the Second Vatican Council produced 16 major constitutions, two of them perhaps the most important for synodality. The first one, Lumen Gentium, the, life of, the Light sorry, of Nations, which is really the constitution on the church, and Gaudium et Spes, which was a pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world. So where even the title tells us that this is bringing something up to date, presenting, if not new material, then interpreting it in different ways. But in fact, Lumen Gentium itself was an extremely important uh, constitution, an extremely important document that really has changed how we see and do church in very powerful ways. It's important that the church itself was reforming internally, responding to its own internal critique. I think it's very definitely a sign of the spirit guiding the Catholic church that it can do that. You know, other institutions or universities, for example, will have accreditation committees come in and tell us what we could do better, what we're not doing properly, those kinds of things. The Catholic Church depends really from that internal critique and people bringing to the surface areas that need to be changed. And to their credit, that's exactly what happened in so many ways. There was a form of listening to a much greater extent, a power of prayer, a power of the spirit, a uh, power of the truth. We very often talk about speaking truth to power. And everybody knows how difficult it is for people who are sometimes seen on the lower levels of any organization to speak up to the people at the top. But very often this has to be done. And in fact, I think that Lumen Gentium, with this constitution in the church, was a major shift in church life, which I'll go back to later, but which has really paved the way for fuller synodality. David. When Moira speaks of the pendulum shift, I like to look at the paradigm shift that's happening as well, because it's really important to remember what she said about how we see and how we do church. Since the beginning of his pontificate, Francis has asked us to look carefully at how we live out our call as the people of God. So Francis, from the very beginning, has been very clear that he wants to view this as a shared journey. In, 19, no, in 2013, just a few months after he became Pope, statements such as this appeared in the Catholic press. Francis wants to change the way the universal church is governed in such a way that the local church, diocesan bishops con conferences, plays a much larger role or part in the decisions that will affect it, while ensuring that Rome can better serve the church worldwide. In short, Francis wants to shorten the distance between Rome and the local church to ensure that they can act better together. But Francis is going beyond this not just to include the voices of the bishops, but to include all the voices of the people of God. Pope Francis models for us this paradigm shift in how we are church and makes us see that it's not only reasonable, but it's necessary as we move forward. He sees synodality as necessary for church leaders and the laity to walk together. In Dr. McQueen's book, we hear this, a different way that allows for the contributions of both as befits their common baptism as members of the people of God in shaping the church. So this model is presented for us. He actually refers to, to the book of Acts when he says, the first and most important manual of ecclesiology is the book of Acts. He notes that it recounts the story of a long road, a long road that starts in Jerusalem and after a long journey ends in Rome. This road, he said, tells the story in which the word of God and the people of God who turn their attention and faith to that word walk together. Everyone is a protagonist in the story. No one can be considered mere extra. At times, it may be necessary for us to leave, to change direction, to overcome convictions that hold us back, 
and prevent us from moving and walking together. But it's necessary to feel part of the great people who are the recipients of the divine promises, open to a future that awaits everyone to participate in the banquet prepared by God for all participants. Francis asks us to take this synodal process seriously, and he tells us that the Holy Spirit needs all of us in order to move forward in seeing the church as the people of God. Mara. Excellent. Thank you. So thank you, David. Exactly. So going back to Lumen Gentium and its importance, this idea of the constitution and the church itself. And to me, to many people, and not just in theology, this was really revolutionary, not just represented by an inverted triangle, but the whole concept. We were really changing. They were changing for us the idea of what's actually involved in church. To call us the church as the people of God really tells us that we're in this together, the whole church. And this was a phrase that's often used in the constitution, the whole church. So instead of dividing us into clerical and lay, which is, has, been, has really come into being through practice as much as anything else. And there is nothing wrong with that division. But there's only something wrong when the division becomes a problem. Nobody really is questioning the, the whole authority of the bishops, uh, the authority that comes from the apostles, that apostolic succession that in turn is coming from scripture, from the greatest authority of all at the beginning of the New Testament. But it's helping us to realize that everybody counts. And I think when we look at the inverted triangle, it gives us quite a different picture. The idea of laity as maybe not necessarily being in the top, but certainly having the longest line, the majority of the people, the bulk of the church, if you like. And the hierarchy depicted, again, this is just a depiction at the bottom in terms of service, which is a very important theological uh, method. The reason, though, was not just you know, numbers or trying to give the laity a, a better voice, so that was certainly part of the picture, but it was more deeply theological in going back to a recognition of why are we in the church at all? And the reason for any of our being baptized into the Catholic Church, baptized into membership of the church, is exactly what gives us the basis for what I call a radical equality, a radical equality of membership through baptism in our church as, as followers of the way. So this is a real shift from a more hierarchical view of the church itself, which I don't think anybody would dispute sometimes still exists in certain societies, but has certainly changed mainly because of this reorientation at Vatican II. Baptism is the common denominator. We, we don't merit it. We are given the gift of baptism by whomever introduces us to that baptism. But it means it's not something that is awarded to anybody superior or anybody that we would judge to have merit. It is simply the gift of God to every single one of the faithful. So in looking at Lumen Gentium and looking at this emphasis on baptism and looking at what we are now recognizing theologically as an equal dignity on every single member of the church, that is the gift. There's also the other side to the responsibility for being responsible for everyone's welfare. And we know how that ties in with Pauline theology. When we're members of the body, we are responsible for all the other members of the body, as well as for our own participation in that body. And it's underlined for me, there are so many phrases from Pope Francis in all his many speeches uh, since 2013, when he came to the papacy. But when he said something as basic as to walk together is the constitutive way of the church, then that's telling us that this, this idea of synodality, this idea of being in communion, participating together, all being responsible for mission, is something essential to our being Catholic, to our being baptized members of the Catholic Church. 
and the emphasis from him and through synodality itself is the emphasis on togetherness. We are all in this, in the body together, but we're in there as gift through baptism and we're also in there now with responsibility to that whole body as well. Can I have the next slide, please, Brandon? So in our hyper-politicized environment today, we too often get focused on ourselves as individuals, on what I want. While each of us is a unique individual created and loved by God, nonetheless, God has made us to be in communion, especially to seek the common good. So the Holy Father wants us to expand greatly the participation of all community discernment. If we're on all part, if we're all part of the body of Christ, then every part must be a valued piece by everyone, not just for the purpose of letting each person express their views. No, it's for the purpose of recognizing that God uses all our talents for the good of all, and that every voice can contribute to the discerning of God's will by the community of faith. So Pope Francis is saying that this radical equality conferred by baptism needs to be recalled, revitalized, and in every aspect of, aspect of the church life until it's more adequately realized, especially by the laity. It's through an understanding of synodality that we can attempt to accompl accomplish this. He's often stressed that there's much resistance to overcome the image of a church rigidly divided between leaders, subordinates, between those who teach and those who have to learn, forgetting that God likes to overturn positions. God likes to make it uncomfortable and shake things up. A good image for this is that walking together helps us discover horizontality rather than verticality as the line. So it helps us to discover horizontality as opposed to verticality. In the synodal journey then, in fact, listening must take into account the census fide. Francis has said, I've come here to encourage you to take the synodal seriously, process seriously and to tell you that you are needed. The Holy Spirit needs you. In listening to him, by listening to yourselves, you do not leave anyone out or leave them behind. This, he said, finally holds not only for those present, but for the whole church. The whole church is not strengthened only by reforming structures or giving instructions, offering retreats and conferences or by dint of directives and programs. But, but if it discovers that the people that desires to work together among itself and with humanity, that's where the strength will come as we see ourselves as the people of God. Next slide, please. Yeah. Right. That, that, is, that is so important, that uh, listening together and seeing ourselves as in that mode, as David says. So now the next few slides are going to deal a little bit more specifically with communion, uh, which is what we were asked to talk about today. And uh, because mainly we can't really divide the three up entirely, they all go together, communion, participation, and mission. But we did say we would talk about communion. So I'm thinking really again of going back to show that this is something very definitely in our tradition that is something that it would be so important to develop even further as Pope Francis and previous popes from the Second Vatican Council onwards have also, have also mentioned, it's been very important, the question of synodality. I think it's true that Pope Francis is moving uh, faster in terms of implementing many of the points that have been raised about synodality in general. But where is he also coming from? He is also going back to look at scripture and the gift of faith, this gift of baptism as followers of the way. Uh, we said they were already in many countries. And I mentioned Acts. And I think, again, it's so important for us uh, theologically to base anything that we're seeing as very important, both in scripture and tradition. So therefore, going back to scriptural warrants, 
for the apostles, first of all, as leaders and first bishops, because this is very important for synodality, the, the coming together of the different groups in the church, working together, but that doesn't mean there are no differences. I mean, there are very clear differences. People are called to be leaders, and of course, we recognize that. And so we, we, when we look at the scriptural warrants for the apostles as the leaders and establishing the succession in our Catholic church, we can also look at the scriptural warrants for how they acted as leaders, what they actually did. And as I already mentioned, actually, they established a walking together in the sense of gathering together so many people to discuss the questions that had to be dealt with at that time. And when James made his announcement that, in fact, circumcision was not going to be necessary for followers of the way, he began his speech, we're told in scripture, by saying, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And that very framing speaks volumes, because right from the very beginning, this first recorded, at least, version of the apostles and elders coming together prioritizes the role of the Holy Spirit. It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, thus giving them the context in which they were speaking and in fact the authority. And so it's hardly surprising that the role of the Spirit is emphasized today when people are talking about synodality as much as possible. Of course, the role of the Spirit is always emphasized in Catholic teaching. I just mean to say that it is really emphasized because what it means is that this is a spiritual movement. In many ways, it would be easy to see it, and I mentioned this in my little book about synodality, as a question of rights, and the laity are looking for not just a voice, but a bigger place at the table, that kind of approach. And maybe some people will, and some of us will misinterpret the meaning of synodality. But we can see when we look back that the real foundation for it is the role of the Holy Spirit as a Catholic church guided by the Spirit, that this, in, again, in invoking the, the wisdom of the Spirit in synodality, walking together, this is what will guide us as synodality or the whole process moves forward. And just to repeat again, that the apostles and the elders, therefore, if you like, the hierarchy and the laity, for want of better terms, discerned together, giving us again that very early depiction of how we can handle questions and new points and even disputes in the Catholic Church. I think there is um, just so much to learn from Scripture, in fact, in a way we're saying here that this discernment is a method. I mean, they, they worked out or they were guided by the Spirit too, because I don't think discernment comes easy, easily to anybody that comes together. So they were, they were on a very fast learning curve, it would seem, and they obviously had some divine guidance there. But that the idea that the Spirit is what guides the way is something I think that, of course, is still fundamental to how we are Catholic today. So the next slide, please. So just what happens really in our local church when we talk about walking together and the basis for that, the basis for that is really our communion, our unity that of course is global in many ways, but for most of us naturally it starts in our local church. This is where we experience being Catholic. This is where we experience worshiping together. This is where we are nourished by the word together. This is where the Eucharist comes into play when we're celebrating the liturgy together. It's the body that gathers to participate. It's the body that's sent forth in mission. The body is our communion. So it's pretty clear that before there can either be participation or mission itself, there has to be the body that's established. And that's exactly, I think, what we mean by the body in our local church. And of course, it's nourished also by the sacraments. And when we're, even, even when we're sent forth in mission, it means that many of us will maybe act together in mission, but it doesn't necessarily mean 
that we're all doing the same mission all the time. No, because we have our own mission, even as we are sent forth at the end of Mass, to utilize our gifts in the world, or in our family, in our, in our location, wherever we are. So the prayer and meditation is something, of course, it's ongoing in our personal lives. But there is something about the gathering of the body and that reinforcement of being sent forth in mission that really prepares us, having been nourished by the Word and by the Eucharist, to go back out into the world to do our job of evangelization in our own particular ways. So communion is really, really important. Communion in terms of the idea of the whole church, the, the emphasis that Lumen Gentium was putting on, what does this mean? If it's the whole church that's, that is involved, then it really needs to be a unified body because of its role, further role then in participation and mission. But the very essence of being a unified body is something that's sometimes quite difficult to achieve as people will sometimes experience even in the local family life, far less, um, the, sorry, the local parish life, as well as life in the whole church with the different questions that come up from time to time. But that idea of the whole church, that idea of all of us being members because of our equality of baptism, which is the core of the church itself, it's also the core of synodality. It will really only work over the long haul, and it possibly will be a long haul, when we really appreciate the idea of the communion that we already have, both locally and globally as well. Just uh, repeating again that the idea of the, the whole church being in communion, you know, I think sometimes when we go to maybe uh, re gatherings that represent people from far-flung places, and we get a better sense of the global church than we sometimes do locally. Sometimes, at least for myself, it reinforces this idea of the community that we have, even with people whom we don't actually know, but being present, celebrating the Eucharist, being nourished by the same word, being nourished by the same food. And it establishes in many ways the idea of I belong to something that clearly is much bigger than myself or my local church, but it is all, to use one of Pope Francis's favorite words, interconnected. And to me, that interconnection is a symbol of communion as well in the whole church. Some, another phrase that Pope Francis is very uh, keen on emphasizing is that Anything that happens to do with arranging synods, so whether we're talking locally, a, a parochial synod, a diocesan synod, a regional synod, a whole universal synod, he's very clear that those arrangements must start from people and their daily problems if a synodal church is to develop. And I think this is very important when we're talking, and although this is under the heading of the whole church, it's the same rule really for the whole church. The same rule, maybe rule is not the correct word, but the same recommendation, uh, even for every single local church, that it must start from people and their daily problems. And I've noticed in looking at some of the stories from some preparations for synods, or maybe in some areas where they already have had synods nationally or, or locally, that the idea of starting from people and their daily problems is something that is going to have to be reinforced. So that it's not just that a, a synod is called locally or regionally, and the, the, the terms are set for the people to then discuss. I think that's fine for starting off, and this is Again, a new process for most of us, and we hope it's going to be around forever as long as the Holy Spirit is guiding it in that direction. But I think this idea of looking at the whole church means that we have to turn our thoughts around a little bit more to start from the bottom, so to speak, or maybe from the grassroots, and to hear what people really want to speak about as opposed to having a topic chosen and then working at it from the top down. So as a way of 
making sure that the whole church is involved. And again, thinking of that inverted triangle, which kind of shows where most people lie on that triangle, then we have to pay more attention to the ideas and questions and problems, whatever actually emerges from listening to people from their daily problems. So the next one, please. So I see this part of communion as some of the first steps of walking together when we're in a parish. I, I don't think there's any way of not looking at the parochial level. I think after what I just said in the other slide, I actually think it's the most important level. Having been fortunate enough to attend a synod, as Mark said at the beginning, it really was a wonderful experience. And it was such a wonderful experience uh, because of its intensity, because of the level of participation, because of the level of experience of communion, that I really, as mission, almost just wanted to come back home and be able to do this locally. And of course, it doesn't happen quite as easily as that. But again, it does seem to me for the whole synodal process to be able to develop, then a concentration should be held at the, at the parish level. Because of where we gather as the body, this is our first community. This is where we first experience communi communion. And I think all of us feel that we need that sense of communion just to feel as if we actually belong to something something where we can go further uh, in, in the terms of mission if we actually arrive at some kind of conclusion. The question at this level, just sort of looking around at parishes in general, is that most parishes need ways to reflect on their community and how they would actually be able to foster communion as well as participation and mission but recognizing that the communion aspect is the, the very, very first one. So I, I just think that is so fundamental um, that it needs to be implemented at the parish level somehow. These are, as I said, it's a long, uh, a long way to go, but if we're walking together, it's possible. But I focus on that area in terms of developing a general communion. So fostering communion, uh, David has some ideas as well. I just see these as uh, starters for the many questions that many of you will have. David, did you want to? No, I, th I think I'd, I'd like to get some feedback from our participants at this point so that we could start to en engage in a little bit of conversation. But yes. you can see on the fostering communion slide where Mara has posed some questions about, is there communal activity open to all? What kinds of things can we do? What are you experiencing within your own churches? Um, what, what can be done to move forward at this first level of, of communion and involvement with the parish? Michelle, are you going to... to yeah, I think that would be good. I think once we started posing questions, um, so I think it's probably a good time to move on. You're right, yeah. Would you like me to come on and moderate some of the questions? That, yeah, please, that's Michelle. my cue? Okay, perfect. I, my camera was going on and I just wanted to make sure. Um, so wonderful. Yes, there are already some questions that have come in. Um, and I think just piggybacking off of, off of some of these questions you've already provided. Um, somebody has asked, does the dialogue include those who have fallen away from their involvement in the church and to those who have given up on the spiritual dimensions of life? If so, how does the church invite them to share their per perceptions of the church and the meaning of Jesus? <laughs> yeah, well, we, we know that there was an attempt to an attempt to do this. Actually, it's, and I think David mentioned this um, that this time, with this particular upcoming synod, the way matters were handled, I think there was a, a real attempt anyway to reach out to everyone. I think it was very clear that as far as anybody who knew about the process that it was definitely intended for everyone, and maybe more especially for people who have fallen away or people who have questions for the church and problems from the church. I certainly had many people ask about that. They wanted to know about, um, you know, could have fallen away, so to speak, members of their families 
participate. Yes, and so they were directed towards the, the questions, um, not just the questions from a diocese because the, the different dioceses had different sets of questions, but there was a way of sending questions directly to the Synod office in Rome as well, which was very useful for some people who didn't want to be you know, either identified or didn't want to go through their, their, their diocese, fair enough, for whatever reason. So the attempt was made, um, and I think that in itself is a, a start at least. I, th I think that's exactly right. And I think that it's a perfect opportunity for, for things like the courtyard of the Gentiles, where that often the universities would gather um, people with, with very, very diverse backgrounds, faith backgrounds, some committed faith, some with no faith backgrounds, to, to engage and, and talk. And I think that this, this whole process has encouraged people to do that, to reach out. I know in some of our own parishes um, that are working in inner cities, that are working with the marginalized folks, had be able, was able to gather them to simply talk. It wasn't just the church going folks that got to answer a survey. The, the intent was to get those other voices. And although oftentimes it was hard to hear, to hear what was being said, it was painful to hear some of the things being said, but, but it was important and I think that's the only way we can move forward in this synodal way if we honestly and authentically listen to and are open to what we are hearing. Yeah, I, I do think just David on that point, uh, it will be very interesting to see, you know, what the responses are, but maybe even more importantly, how they are responded to after that, after the bishops through the discernment, etc. So. I think part of the problem is, well, again, because this is new and so therefore it's imperfect and you know, it will take a while before it, even the method of having people have their voices heard will take some time, but it's, it, is, it has begun and we can only hope, I presume, that it will improve and then it's up to the rest of us to make sure that people to whom this information, you know, it's, it's finding how to get the information to people who perhaps would really like to have it, it's always challenging. Yeah. Exactly. And I think we all know that time within the church doesn't move quickly, but that much of what we're learning from the synodal process is going to be useful within the parish, within the, the grassroots of, of, of our parishes and how we do and how we see and how we are church in our own communities. I think we'll see growth and change there before we see any kind of universal change. But I think that's that's something really positive that's coming out of this is getting parishes talking and exploring yeah. things. Well, that, that's a good segue because there's actually a couple of questions about, about the parish level. Um, so, so a couple of people asking, how would you recommend approaching a priest or others in the parish who believe more in a model of the separation between the, the pastor and the community. Um, how do you walk side by side, this walking together? How, what are some recommendations to, to close this gap? Uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I you wish stuck. I could say. I, <laughs> I, I wish I could say. Um, I, have, I have to confess that I have not started to do this in my own parish community. So... This is, that's an absolute lapse on my part, not because I don't intend to do it. Uh, there, some other people were already doing something for this particular synod. And in a way, I've been waiting to see what happens. Recommendations as how to do it, it comes back so often to an assessment of that particular role of the pastor and the, the members of that particular congregation. I think, you know, Michelle, I think there is immense amount of educational work to be done about synodality, the process that is really, because now we're talking about doing it really, uh, but in terms of both the laity and clergy, I've heard so many people, so many people are enthusiastic, clearly probably everybody listening today will be enthusiastic because otherwise I don't think they'd be paying attention. Uh, but many people are, are dismissive of the process uh, and I've heard it on both cler from clergy and lay. It is going to be difficult. David used the word resistance. I use the word resistance as well. Of course, there will be resistance. This is a little bit like the Second Vatican Council when there are new, new happenings. Uh, people do resist change. There are all sorts of personality conflicts, quite apart from you know, um, theological questions. I think there's an awful lot of work to be done. 
I'm not brave enough to suggest a way otherwise, other than more and more learning, more and more practical experience, and a lot of courage. When I talk about speaking truth to power, I really believe that I've experienced it in other areas that I work in, uh, more than in this particular area, where I have to speak up about areas that are not popular, that, you know, that actually sometimes result in people not just sort of reacting personally towards one, those kind of things. That doesn't bother me because, well, it bothers me the usual human way, but it doesn't really bother me when I, I really, when one really believes one is doing the right thing, one just has to do it and, and hope that it is the right thing and people will respond, you know. But in this in this particular area, um, is a question. Yeah, maybe David has better answers. And I think, um, the, are we getting the French? I can hear Michelle. Through? Yeah. Okay. One of one of the challenges that I think it it presents for us is that pastoral teams have to change their mindset and how how they're looking at doing things within the parish, because we're not so much putting on programs that we think the parish needs, we need to be listening for what what does the parish want? What does the parish need in reality? Not, not our, our perceived needs. And I think that's a challenge for pastoral teams to, to look at how can they be open to what are the needs within the parish that, that are real, honest needs that need to be explored. They may be totally different from what we think they need as to what the parishes need. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, there's and there's a few, actually another a couple of questions that are speaking to um, having from the diocese having gone through the process, it being very positive that there's been a cultural shift, that there's been some movement, and how do we continue this process, the synodal process, even after we've done this first phase? Is there any you know thoughts about how um, you know there, there's already been seen some some positive effects? How do we continue this rather? Yeah after the phase is over? I think I'll, I'll start with that way, right? Because I think what's going to happen next is most important because what happens now is mm -hmm. the report is written, it's all been read, and I'll, I can only speak for our own diocese. We had over 2,000 respondents. So all of that data has come in. It's been synthesized, a report has been formulated, and it will be sent on. But the important thing is what's next because the next process, this will go to 2023. We can't just hold off and not do anything on it because we've we've asked for input, we've listened, and now as a diocese, as a parish, as we need to act on that in some way. So I think it's that next step within within the the community itself as to where they go with it. For instance, in Hamilton, it is moving forward with another program that uh, is moving forward together in Christ. So there's a a look at how we're going to move forward post-pandemic, post the synodal process. So it, it's never meant, and I go back to what Pope Francis said, it's not meant as a one-off deal. We're not just doing this to get it done. And if we are, we're really losing sight of where we could go. It's how are we now going to take this and incorporate it into how we are doing church and how we're being church. And if we if we don't change that or we don't take that opportunity, we're missing something really important. Or yeah, I absolutely agree. And we're always being reminded that a synod is not an event. You know, we hear that phrase time after time. Is it once it's over, it's gone, like a Leafs game, it's gone, sort of thing. <laughs> uh, and of course, it's not that at all. It is. I mean, it is really meant to radicalize in some ways, again, as Lumen Gentium did at Second Vatican II, turn around the church and how we do things. So Pope Francis is, has been very clear that, you know, when he's using words like this as a constitutive element of the church, this is an essential way for the church. He's really saying this is how we have to do it. Well, none of us wants to be told perhaps that this is the way we have to do it. But I think he means it, obviously, in the idea that if the church is to develop, if we are to really maintain our communion uh, and sort of get over this, the divisions by listening to one another, 
then it is it is perhaps maybe um, maybe not the only way forward, but perhaps the most positive way forward that we have at the minute. We can see radical divisions and and approaches even to Catholicism, even approaches to the papacy, even just in North America alone. So you know there are some really uh, divisive elements at, at work at present. So. To be working in some way, uh, and Davidson, of course, is diocesan. I think, in and so instead of waiting till there's the actual event synod in 2023, I think we are really being encouraged to move forward in our own ways. And so when I said, "Well, I haven't done anything about the parish yet," but the idea of parish synod appeals to me greatly. If that doesn't work, there's, possi- there's a possibility of a diocesan synod. I think there's other ways um, that are in a way in the church and external to the church. So even in my own field of bioethics, I'm considering having a conference in the fall that operates in a synodal mode. So by instead of I give a lecture, then the people who come, they will talk about the questions and problems they have. And now we're talking about Catholic teaching, so it's still Catholic. You can see where I'm going with this that, you know, that to give the opportunity for those questions to emerge, because a lot of people do have questions both about Catholic doctrine, Catholic teaching, pastoral practice, all those sorts of things. And I think it would be so valuable to either a parish or a diocese or any other Catholic group to have some kind of system like this synodal process where those questions are raised, first of all, for people who don't have a chance to have a voice, listened, and then the important part about discernment. So there's, I think there's a lot we can do, you know, in in between and not just wait for something to come from Rome. Um, Important, of course, though that is going to be, but I don't think that's the only manifestation of it, that we, we need to wait for something. I think we can also act. That's, that's great. Um, so I'm just looking at a, a couple of, uh, there's lots of questions. So thank you. And I'm trying to scroll through them and sometimes oh. they're long. So I'm trying yeah. to synthesize, but really there's a, there's a lot of questions and, and discussion around this. Um, another one, perhaps is, as again, uh, at the, the parish community level. Um, so, we, you know, we've talked about the enthusiasm, enthusiasm, the positive. Um, and what about the parishioners uh, with general passiveness or even cynicism um, to this concept. And there's some questions about, well, uh, so that's, that's one question. And maybe I could tag on that um, questions about, well, what about, what about what's already good in the church? What about more, you know, the traditional things that we know and love? Um, how do we, can we ha- bridge uh, some of these, some of these different, you know, the beauty of, of the different diversity within the Catholic church? I think I think this this is a question that comes up because of the timing as well, because it, in many ways it was the best time and it was the worst time. It was the best time because it was wonderful that the, we were asking the church, we're asking the people of God what they think. It was the worst of times because it came during a pandemic, so people were frustrated, they were upset, they were angry, and I think that colored some of the responses to the to the to the surveys and to the questions that were raised as well because people felt under pressure or they were under under a cloud and I think that was was difficult so that while there there are still many things that people love about the church as, as you said some of the beauty some of the traditions that are there the things were colored because of the way people were feeling and I think that um, that there's always going to be a polar points. But I think we're more polarized now than we have been in the past because of the situation. So that those that want things to return the way they were, those that think we haven't changed enough, getting to that point of discussion is going to be a challenge um, as we move forward. But I think we're hearing it. At least we're engaging in those conversations now. And people are are not, be, they're comfortable expressing that, that it's something that's important to them. And I think giving voice to that and opportunity for that discussion is important. Or? Yeah, no, I, I agree about the pandemic. I mean, it was a dampener for just about everything. That's right. 
the, of course, the, you know, the sexual abuse crisis was really something driving a lot of the negative comments. And, and you're right, uh, David, that giving people the opportunity to raise the points, the negative are going to come out as well as the positive. And sometimes people, the negatives are more likely to be the ones to express that view because if you're happy with something, you maybe don't bother telling anybody about it. I mean, that's just human nature, if you like. I was thinking of a diocesan synod in Liverpool in England, which had begun before the pandemic and was halted a little bit, but then was able to take place. But because it was regional and so not dealing with the questions that have to be forwarded to Rome, then there was they, the way they struck their committee was that there were different opportunities for which questions would be raised. And so, and I think people were given a survey type thing of, you know, which questions do you want discussed from a list of about 50, something like that. And I, I, that approach, I think, was pretty successful because I think when people feel that they're invested even in the questions at the very beginning, then there is maybe a, a, perhaps a better willingness to respond. Not that that meant there were always positive responses. I mean, we're not looking for Pollyanna, you know, sort of conclusions. We're trying to, I think, get real questions with real possibilities for discussion with possibilities of looking for solutions on the table. And I think that is, is so important. But I think, again, it goes back to the idea that if, if you have somebody who's willing uh, to, first of all, suggest a synod local and to work at ways of having questions raised that are perhaps more appropriate to that particular area than to some other countries. So they weren't dealing so much with, say, the sexual abuse crisis, those kinds of things that would be ironed out. Because you're right, I think all those uh, negatives do colour the responses a lot and presumably will be filtered into the, the discernment process because the bishops too are aware of the context in which you know, the, these, this, the responses to the Rome Senate have been collected. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, I, maybe a question on the process. So you've talked about it and perhaps just maybe recap. There's some questions about well, can people travel to Rome for the Synod? How, what is the process um, that we maybe we've gone through and where are we going and how does that really look kind of concretely? Hmm. Well, I, I can speak to the, the reports. Moira, maybe you could talk to personnel. Um, the, this, the Synod documents have all been collated at the diocesan level all across the country and now they're being sent to the their conferences of bishops so in, in ontario the uh, ontario bishops will receive all of the reports and they will then make one report which will go to the cccb the cccb then will gather those reports and they'll send them on as well before they reach rome so there's a huge process where it's all since the synthesized down so the diocesan level really has the most amount of data that comes in because as it moves along it gets smaller and smaller but all that data everything is going to be sent. Like it will all end up in Rome. I have no idea what happens to it once it gets there, but but it all is going to end up there with the reports. So that the I think there are 17, Bishop Crosby could correct me on this, 17 dioceses in, in um, Ontario. So there'll be 17 reports that will go to the on, Ontario bishops and the Ontario bishop level, those will be synthesized to one report that will go from Ontario to the, the Canadian Conference of Bishops. Now, all of that material is the hard copy that will inform how the, the synod itself is structured, the, um, the instructions that will go out to the bishops for, for um, preparations for the synod. How the participants are, are chosen, that I don't know. Moira, do you know? How, uh, how will laity uh, be chosen for that? Uh, I don't know if it varies from country to country. I mean, Principally, of course, the bishops themselves decide on which representatives they will send because it's a synod, which is just representative. It's not a council, so all the bishops can't go. So even they have to decide at that level. And I, I know when I went, I think I think I was just one lay person. The hows and whys of it, I don't know. Um, and I, I think the next time two people were, were invited to go as lay representatives, and I think this time at least two, uh, from Canada. So I, I think they're the same ones going through this whole process. So that the part of the, you know, 
who who's responsible for inviting whom, I think it lies yeah. with the bishops themselves. Yeah. Right. And presumably they will ask somebody who's maybe involved already in the particular area. For example, I went to the Synod in Marriage and the Family. Well, I teach grad level courses in marriage and sexuality. So, you know, I think there is a kind of direct link there. I, I think that normally that's what would probably happen. But as I mentioned in, in the little book I wrote about being at the Synod, there were many lay representatives there. Um, maybe, you know, you're not there because you have a PhD or anything like that. It's more in direct involvement in a particular topic. So many people were family life representatives from their country with really terrific pastoral experience, which in turn fed in some really direct uh, content to the discussions that was in it itself. It was it's, it's, uh, the one thing I do wish, and I probably just have to say it again, <laughs> is it's such an important process that I do wish more lay people could, could attend. I really yeah. do think it would be wonderful. But that, you know, I think that's a wait and see how it develops. And if enough people make that point, perhaps that voice will be heard as well. <laughs> wonderful. Well, that I think we've done a pretty good scope of, of questions. I don't know if there's any of these questions you have on your slide that you want to conclude with, but I think we've... Uh, able to sort of summarize most of the questions in the Q&A. Okay. I, I think you, had a, you have a final slide, Moira, right? Yes? Is I did have one more. Thank you, David. That might help. That might be the sort of final, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the way forward, because we were, we were thinking the same thing, of course. It's not an event. It's a, a process in the sense of a spiritual process and a very practical and pastoral process as well. And when Pope Francis made this announcement at one of his lectures that synodality is, is what the Lord expects of the church in the third millennium, you could see that this, I mean, I call this visionary. This is, this is coming from the Pope himself. And it's not just Pope Francis expects this of the church, but no, it's the Lord himself expects of the church in the third millennium. This is a huge demand. It's a huge gift as well at the same time. It's pitched very, very high. And to me, it really fits in with um, one, of, one of the key points I think of when I'm thinking about communion, participation and mission and mission, I know still coming at the end, but everything is going towards, you know, the way forward. And it's very much go, you are sent forth. And this is what the Lord expects of you. And I think this is the, a good way to end on this is to keep in mind that as the next two sessions unfold, you'll see the interconnectedness of the three, part, the three parts of it. So that communion, participation, and mission can't be really separated. We can separate them to speak about them in, in interview, but they're intricately intertwined as we move, move forward. Mark? Well, thank you very much, Moira and David. Um, you know, on a personal note, I've had the opportunity to work very closely with both of you over the last number of years, and it has been always a privilege and an honor, and I've learned a lot from, from each of you as well. Um, so today, I just want to thank you for reminding us that uh, synodality is about walking together and listening to one another as church. Um, that uh, you've helped us to see that synodality uh, through the lens of history from the beginning, that's a, that's a very important point. This isn't just some one-off idea. This is an, a part of an evolution of our, of our history in the church, and there have been ebbs and flows of that. So thank you for reminding us, us of that. And that our baptism is uh, causes us to be call, we need to respond uh, through our baptismal call and that we have a role in shaping the future of the church, such a critical thing. Um, and you've given us a vision of how communion might be lived out in within um, our parishes, within our diocese, the, the church at large, and certainly within our homes even. So I thank you for your insights. I thank you for your wisdom and I thank you for showing us a way forward together. Very, very much appreciate your, your work here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>